Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057. This is week 11 for Term 3 2016. In fact, this is our last Zoom session. Next week, we have our take-home exam. And tonight, we will talk about that take-home exam in general terms. I can't be too specific, but I'll provide you with some hints. If you haven't already looked at Moodle today, or looked at your emails or looked at what's on you crew, you um, won't know that um, I've put up some information about the exam and some background material. I'll go through that as well. Um, so that provides the basic information that you need to know about the um, examination. Uh, for those of you that have contributed material week by week in relation to the Moodle questions, thank you very much. Um, I trust that you will find going through that exercise will help you substantially for the take home examination. And I'm sorry I haven't followed the traditional route of going through those tutorial questions every week, but you probably tell that my style of tutoring or lecturing, whatever you might decide, is much more fluent than that. Uh, I, like, I like to change it up a bit. Um, all right, so thank you very much for your participation in that regard. Okay, it is feedback week. I need to ask a favour. If you haven't provided the feedback, would you please, please do that for me this week? I'm nine short in introduction to law on what's regarded as a pass mark in terms of the number of people providing feedback. The information that you provide by way of feedback is um, uh, secure for you. It's um, anonymous, um, so don't be concerned about being truthful. And certainly from my perspective and the university's perspective, we do want people to be truthful in terms of um, what you put on your feedback. So if you have already provided feedback, thank you very much. If you haven't, please do so. All right. Let's look at the briefing paper statement that I alluded to, that I put up on Moodle and um, sent round by email today. Before I start, there are a number of people online. Do we have any questions? Does anyone want to ask any questions about that first or are you happy for me to go through it? No? Okay. All right, so 40 marks. The paper will be released on Monday. The paper will be released in much the same way that I've released the information to you in the um, paper statement today. I'll send it to you by email. I'll probably put it on the front page of um, Ucrew uh, and Moodle as well. Your task is to provide me with your response. I know later than 11.45 p.m. on Wednesday, now, arguably, that's way too much time. I'll just share this with you. The indication through the law discipline meeting that we've had now is we should make these 24 hours. So you're probably the last group to go through with the benefit of having luxury of 48 or 50 hours. Um, I think I've even given you a bit more than that. So enjoy that opportunity, but also note that if you find that, uh, and I'm really, I don't think I'm necessarily speaking to the people that are online now, but if you're viewing this later and you think that uh, for whatever reason you can't sit the examination, if you consider applying for an extension, which you can do, bear in mind two things. And this is really important. The first is that if you apply for an extension, it may take some time for it to be processed. It's not done by me. It's out of my hands. It's an examination process. It goes to a level much higher than me. It is scrutinised very carefully. You need to have very good reason not to sit an examination. Bear in mind, this take-home paper is meant to be the in exchange for an invigilated examination where we actually get you in to a location and you sit for three hours and you handwrite an exam. So given that it's very hard to get out of that, this is offered as an alternative to create flexibility. So it's very difficult to get an, an extension. And if you fail in your request for an extension, 
then that's no basis for any consideration in marking. So it's no point saying, oh, look, please give me some consideration. I was waiting for an answer to my request for an extension. Doesn't matter. So in other words, you take a risk. My thoughts are just get in and do the exam. You've got more than 48 hours. It's plenty of time. So you would need extremely good reasons to apply for an extension. Anyway, I'm speaking to the converter. Um, 2,000 word limit. Word limit. Your, John, how long should it take us? Oh, look, I've said, um, you, there's a hint in the exam question that it comes through. I've said, you know, a day, but it's not going to take you a day. Um, again, referring to what was discussed at the law discipline meeting today, the indication is that what has been set should take four hours or so. I think you'd probably want to take a bit longer than that, but if you allowed yourself four hours, that would be plenty to get through the work. But um, uh, one uh, advantage of the take-home exam is if you've got the time, you know, you can sort of um, just luxuriate it over it a bit if you wish. But if you set aside four hours, if you've got work or other commitments, and you can, you can get yourself four hours during that time, that'll be enough to do it. Okay. Uh, I'm getting a thanks for giving so much time. I, I, I won't be able to do it again. So you, as I said, you're the lucky ones. You're the last group that will have that luxury. It'll be definitely 24 hours from now on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is provide you with a theoretical scenario. And tonight I'll address some of the aspects of this textbook that will assist you in preparing for answering that question. You need to work to a short deadline. You need to submit the work by Moodle. I'd recommend you don't leave it till 11.40 because it will actually cut off at 11.45 p.m. And if we get a few people all congregating at the same time, we may have a problem. So if you're ready to go and you're uploading it, don't be afraid to upload it early. Once we start, I'm not giving any hints, there's nothing, nothing like that. So. Uh, there won't be any disadvantage in submitting the work early. The um, work you submit is through Moodle in the usual manner. Um, put that into a Word document. Make sure that you follow the usual rules in relation to referencing the material. I've set out a, a briefing paper rubric, but I will say this. Um, whether there's one, two or 20 questions contained within the question that I provide to you, I leave it for you to decide the relative importance of dealing with certain aspects. I'll give you this hint. You need to identify the material facts. You need to identify the type of action that we're dealing with and come up with some response to a scenario that calls upon you to provide something in writing as if you're a first year lawyer. So for a moment, we're gonna pretend that you're in first year and you're gonna provide a written advice. That's, that's the task that I've set for you. Um, now I know of course that you haven't done constitutional law, administrative law, torts law, contract criminal law, equity, etc. But, I'll show you parts of the text that I'm going to rely upon in justifying the question that I've asked of you in that take home exam. All right, are there any questions based on what I've said so far? Um, there's a if one puts the draft into Moodle, will it take the draft as the final submission? Look, if I see a draft in Moodle and we reach the time cutoff, I treat it as a final. I assume that it was meant to be a final rather than um, deny that. If you've uploaded something in Moodle, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. Hey John, what's the yes. difference between the advice that we did with the firefighter and a briefing paper? Yeah. Um, I'll say this, and, and um, Associate Professor Scott Beatty has been instrumental in reworking the assessment mode for introduction to law and statutory interpretation this year. Those of you that are keen viewers of Zoom sessions and YouTube sessions may be aware that I've been doing this for a number of years 
as um, and Wayne Jones has. Uh, Wayne has been doing this for longer than I have. So uh, Scott Beatty has come in and put on a fresh look at the way in which you do the assessment. I really like this assessment regime. I think it's um, very practically orientated. But there is a difference in terminology. Uh, so I've come entirely from the private um, sector where I've been practicing in law since 1984, continuously. So I'm coming late to the university sector where I arrived, I think, five years ago or so. Um, Professor Beatty has come from a different perspective. Um, probably hasn't practiced or hasn't practiced to a great degree, but is enormously um, skilled and experienced in other areas, including areas which uh, involve, I guess, the presentation of briefing papers. So in practice, in, in a law office, you're not going to get people ask for a, a, a briefing paper, but you will in, in government. Those of you that are associated with government will probably say we do briefing papers all the time, but it's a new terminology for me. So um, because this is introduction to law and not statutory interpretation, Sharon, to answer your question, is a bit difficult because some people won't know what we did in the um, statutory interpretation uh, question that you referred to. So I'm really just being a bit vague in my response. And I'll say this, that a briefing paper to me is really an advice or a memorandum of opinion, something along those lines. Sorry, very long answer to a simple question. Sorry, Sharon. Um, excuse me, John, don't Mr. we have Cutter? to do a memorandum of advice? Or is that for stat? Mm. Let's see, how have I described it? I've described it as a memorandum of advice. That's essentially what you'll have to do. So the briefing paper, to me, is a memorandum of advice, and it's a question of the person to whom you're directing this advice. I'll give you another hint. Because I've come from the private sector, the question that you'll be asked in the briefing paper is much more with a private sector flavour than would be a public sector flavour. Apologies to those of you that are in the public sector. But it doesn't really matter. The principles are the same. It's just maybe the flavour of the question is something that I'm more familiar with and more comfortable with. I hope that answers your question, Dakota. All right. Now, you can talk about this question with your peers. Originally, in my first draft, I said don't, but I've changed my view. And the fact is that if I'm giving people 50 odd hours, naturally people will talk. However, you must be careful. When sharing ideas, please retain something that's your response. It is an individual assessment, and you must not collude. And there's that very um, consultation is one thing, colluding is another. So you've got to be very careful and it's a fine line. If in doubt, be conservative and don't run the risk of doing something that might affect your academic or professional integrity. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's move on then <coughs> to what it is that you can do to prepare for this briefing paper. I would like you to have a look at your textbook. Now, excuse me a moment. Now, I hope we're not going to be um, tossed out of this session because a little pop-up came up on my screen to say that Someone is um, trying to join the session in a different way. So let's, uh, let's hope that everything goes well. If something goes wrong, I'll re-record as a mock-up. Okay. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about research skills for litigation. The question that you'll be asked next week has a litigation flavour about it. That probably doesn't surprise you. And when you're considering litigation, let's think about some of those things that we talked about over the last few weeks. Some of the preliminary questions. Is the debt, if it's a debt, statute barred? 
what is the cause of action? How do you proceed by instituting proceedings in a court or a tribunal? What's the jurisdiction? Is it state or federal? Are there special pieces of legislation such as the National Consumer Credit Protection Act that might affect the situation or the consumer code or the criminal code? What's the nature of the proceedings to commence the action? Is it a claim or an application? And how might you go about enforcing any judgment? Now, that's if it's a civil question, but it might be a criminal question. And in that regard, I'm going to show you something um, that I think is of uh, great assistance. It's something I put up on Moodle this afternoon and I promised that I would talk about it tonight. So as we're speaking, I'm looking for that document so I can call it up onto the screen. Uh, the document I'm talking about is what's described as a ready rectum. And uh, if you haven't looked at that, then uh, I encourage you to do so. So does anyone, uh, has anyone had a look at that uh, ready rectum? I'm just having trouble. There. So has anyone had a look at that ready reckoner at this stage? No? Okay. Did you put it? Not yet. On, I put it on, on Ucrew. On Ucrew. Oh. All right. Look, if you can bear with me, I'm going to share the screen. And I've got documents flying everywhere here behind the scenes. So let me locate it and then we can have a look at it together. Um, but I would recommend that you print this and have it ready, not just for the exam, I'm not saying this is necessarily the exam, but it's, it's possibly going to be part of the exam or the full exam, but you'll use it during, the, um, during practice anyway. All right, so let's have a look at sharing the screen. And you should, now be able to see my second screen. Can you see that? Can you see what appears to be a ready retina? Might be a bit hard to read. You can all see that, just a thumbs up. All right, good. <coughs> okay. All right, so here's the situation. You are a first year lawyer. You're sent down to the criminal courts, the magistrate's court for the first appearance in relation to a matter, your instructions are to defend the matter on behalf of the client. The procedure will go something a bit like this. The magistrate will say, yes, appearance, please. You'll announce your appearance. May it please the court. My name is such and such, initial such and such. Solicitor with XYZ lawyers, I appear for the defendant. Yes, what's happening with this matter? Mr. X, Ms. X, what's happening with this matter? Uh, Your Honour, the um, defendant is charged with X, Y, Z, and I have instructions to proceed in the following way. And the court will say, yes, how are we going to proceed with this charge? So now here's the thing. This is exactly the point where you need to know what you're going to say. Because whether it's criminal law or civil law, there's a common mistake that people make, and it's this. The common mistake is to simply say, we're going to contest this charge, or we're going to pursue this action, whatever the case may be. Because leaving it at that fails to acknowledge a very important thing, and that important thing is where and how are you going to defend this charge, prosecute this action, make this claim, or defend this application? So you need to know something about the jurisdiction. So in terms of criminal law, this ready reckoner from Peter Shields, who's a lawyer in Brisbane, and has generously allowed us to use this document, is great. Okay, I need to explain a few things. Let's have a look at, uh, if you can look at this document here, section 72, a fray. Now that's a reference to the criminal code. So section 72 is section 72 of the Queensland Criminal Code. You've got to know how to access that. The offence, the charge is a fray. 
the maximum penalty is one year. And you'll see it's a dot in the first of four columns, and that is it's a matter that must be dealt with summarily. Section 552BA of the Criminal Code says that it must be dealt with summarily. What that means is that it must be dealt with by a magistrate. It can't be dealt with by a district court judge, and it can't be dealt with by a Supreme Court judge. It's dealt with by a magistrate. There is an exception to that. I'll come to that shortly. But let's just assume for a moment the form is correct in that it must be dealt with summarily. Summarily means with a magistrate. So if you're standing in front of a client, in front of a magistrate on the first appearance and you say, I appear for XYZ charged with a fray under the criminal code, section 72. I have instructions to ask for this to be transferred to the, to the district court for a not guilty plea. Bong, magistrate will say it has to stay here. Okay, so the idea of this chart is to give you a preliminary guide as to where the matter is dealt with. You need to know that at the start. Let's contrast that with the first one. I've never had this charge, Section 51, unlawful drilling. Never seen it in practice, but it's there, maximum penalty seven years. And you'll see that the dot is in the second column, must be dealt with upon indictment. What does that mean? I'll just stop the share. What does must be dealt with by indictment mean? Anybody tell me? No takers? Must be committed to the DC, says Rebecca. Thank you very much. That's almost entirely correct. Not entirely correct, because it may be committed to the Supreme Court. So an indictment is a document that is really just it's nothing very fancy about it. It sounds very technical, an indictment, but it's really just a sheet which outlines a charge and someone from the DPP alleges that a certain that your client, if you're acting for defence, has done something wrong and the indictment is presented to a judge. So in order for this indictment procedure to, to go ahead, the matter must proceed from the magistrate's court to the district court or the Supreme Court, depending on the nature of the charge. And typically that is done by way of a committal. A committal is a screening process to get it from the magistrate's court to the higher courts. So when Peter Shield says, look, if your client is charged with unlawful drilling, it must be dealt with upon indictment. That means that unless the prosecution withdraw the charge, or unless the magistrate says in a committal situation, there's no basis for this to go to a higher court, there's not enough evidence, then the fact is that the magistrate won't deal with it finally. I hope that makes some sense and I hope that hasn't been too quick. Now, if I've lost you with all of that, please stop me now. Ask me to repeat it in English or we're all good? Okay. Okay, um, Louise says, if the client, client pleads guilty, you can deal with it though, can't you? The answer is generally not. If it must be dealt with by way of uh, on indictment, then that means even on a plea of guilty, it has to go up. But there are some exceptions to that. Um, and without trying to complicate it too much, one of the exceptions is like this. If a, a person is charged with, say, robbery and trespass, all associated with the same incident, the same facts really, um, then even though trespass is a charge that must be dealt with in the magistrate's court, if you're pleading guilty to the robbery, there is a procedure where administratively you can transfer the, tra the trespass charge up to the district court so that it dovetails on with another charge. Oh, Rebecca, a 651 application. Yes, spot on. That's it. That's the one. All right. Um, so there is a, a way that it can, it can piggyback another more serious charge. But if your client is charged with murder, even though they intend to plead guilty, then you, you can't just stand in front of a magistrate and say, charge of murder, we, accept, we take the charge as read, have instructions to enter a plea of guilty. Magistrate also, I can't deal with murder. 
that's got to go to a different court. Have a look at your ready reckoner. Okay. Um, all right. So there is another option which used to be very common, far less common now, and that is in relation to defence election and prosecution election. If you look in the reckoner, section 208, unlawful sodomy, maximum penalty 14 years. In certain circumstances, that's why we've got a dot with the equal sign, in certain circumstances that can actually be dealt with in front of the magistrate and Rebecca, that would be on a plea of guilty. It's one of those electional things with a variation, a bit of a twist. Um, if we find a dot that doesn't have the, um, the, uh, the, the little equal sign, let's say section 339 down the bottom, assault occasioning bodily harm, that's a genuine defence election where the defendant can elect either on a plea of guilty or not guilty for the matter to, to be dealt with summarily in front of a magistrate or on indictment in front of a judge. So they get the choice. Uh, you'll see that there are some charges where the prosecution gets the election. So section 340, which deals with serious assaults, the prosecutor gets to say, I would like this dealt with in front of the magistrate. I would like this dealt with in front of the district court judge. They get to choose. So the three, four, section 340, is the 552A situation where the prosecution elects as opposed to say 339, which is 552B and the defence gets to elect. All right. The good thing about introduction to law is you don't really need to know the elements of the charge. I'm not going to ask you for anything like outline your defence. But in introduction to law, I want you to know where matters are dealt with and to know something about the basic procedure. That's a little bit of a hint. Okay, so have a look at that printout by Peter Shields. Ask some questions in Ucrew if we're having troubles with it. But otherwise, I think it's pretty logical. And once again, thank you, Peter, for allowing us to use that form that uh, you prepared. Before I move on, are there any questions? All good? Okay. Let's have a look at your textbook. You can follow along with this bit because I'm going to highlight the parts of the text that I think are most relevant for the take home exam. Let's start by looking at page 13, which deals with work sectors. Okay, now why is this relevant to the take home exam? Well, the fact is that I've tailored this course towards those people who are going to practice in law. I accept that many of you won't, but maybe it's the nature of my background, but that's the way I've tailored the course. But litigation is not just for barristers in private practice. Look at the flow chart on the right hand side on the text and you'll see six groups of lawyers and all of those people must have a knowledge of how and where matters are considered. So whether you're in private practice, in-house counsel, government, legal aid, community legal centre or you're a member of the judiciary, you've got to know where matters are dealt with, whether that's civil or criminal. Let's have a look at page 25. And on page 25, you'll see what's called the Priestly 11. The Priestly 11 provides a general categorization of different areas of practice, not every area of practice, but general areas of practice. I mean, one that we don't see there as a separate area of practice is alternative dispute resolution. We don't see um, environmental law, for example. So there are many other areas of practice. But the reason I'm pointing that to you is you've got to know what each of those mean. So that if a problem is presented to you, you at least have an opportunity to say, yep, this is a company law problem. 
This is an equity problem. This is a problem that deals with evidence or administrative law. So you've got to understand what those categories mean so that you can at least start to look in the right place when you're considering the question of where is this matter going to be dealt with and how is this matter going to be dealt with. Have a look at page 26. Just over the page and you'll see the threshold learning outcomes for law. The reason I'm pointing to this is that the take-home exam question requires you to have knowledge. Not substantive knowledge in terms of or what are the elements of a contract or what's the appropriate defence for assault occasioning bodily harm. Not that type of knowledge, but the threshold knowledge about things I've been talking about. I won't repeat them again. You'll need to have some knowledge of ethics and professional responsibility, and we've talked about that. So make sure that you've got your copy of um, practice rules uh, in relation to ethical behaviours. So that's the barrister's rule or the Australian solicitor's conduct rules, or both. So that'll come into it or could well come into it. Number three, thinking skills. Well, clearly that's the case. And the, the idea of this exercise, the take home exam, is for you to get thinking about things. Research skills. Once you've identified an area of practice, you're going to have to do some research to answer the question properly. So having your research skills, I think, means you've got to have access to the good materials and know how to use those materials. If you're going to, be a, if you're going to do this task in four hours, it does presuppose that you've got your research skills and you've got your websites lined up ready to go. Communication skills in the form of written communication and to some degree self-management will all be tested in the take-home exam. Now page 28 deals with learning effectively and the thing that I wanted you to take from this is the way in which law is presented now is different, very different to what it was in my day. It may not seem it tonight with me doing all the talking, but what we're trying to do is provide you with an opportunity to take the steps necessary to make your own learning as effective as possible. So that means you've got to have your own ways of doing these things ready to go. Now, page 45 deals with categories of law. And in the same way that I mentioned the Priestley 11, You've got to understand the difference between substantive and procedural law, public and private law, civil and criminal law, domestic and international law. Have that flow chart at page 46 ready so you can think to yourself, does the legal problem that I'm faced with fit into one or more of those categories? And if so, which ones and how do I deal with them? So understand the basic breakdown as categorised from page 45 onwards. Then think about the purposes of law, which you'll see at page 49. In the take home exam, you may be given a scenario where the task is to assist the parties to resolve disputes, to maintain social order, to reinforce community values, help the disadvantaged, stabilise the economy or prevent the misuse of power. So all of those things may come into it. And law is meant to be certain, flexible and accessible, but just bear this in mind. Simply because the law is stated in a textbook or legislation or cases, doesn't mean that it will of itself create a solution. It's up to you as the practitioner to consider all of the options and deal with them through the court or the ADR process. Don't worry about ADR, I'm really looking at, which is the alternative dispute resolution, I'm really looking to test you in your ability to identify the appropriate court or tribunal type process. Now page 96 deals with the issue of Common law and equity. 
we've talked about common law a bit during the course. We've talked about equity a bit during the course as well, probably quite a bit. And you would have worked out <clears throat> that common law is used in two ways. The first is to contrast to legislation. Legislation, parliamentary made law, common law, judge made law, doctrine of precedent. If there's a, an inconsistency between the two, parliamentary law applies. Parliamentary sovereignty applies. So the law of a statute overrides the law of, made by judges through case law, which is common law. But you've also picked up that common law is used in a different sense, and common law is used as the contrast to equity. Common law and equity. And that all goes back to historical days where there was the, the courts in England, which were the black letter law courts that applied common law strictly by its black letter, as we say, as opposed to equity, where, which is chancery. And the courts adopted an attitude of responding in a way that was fair and flexible. Now, they came together in 1873 in the Judicature Act, but not entirely. Because <coughs> we still talk about common law remedies and we talk about equitable remedies. Excuse me just one sec. Post viral on. Okay. Um, so, does everyone understand the difference between a common law remedy and an equitable remedy? And is if if so, does anyone want to give me a statement of what is a co an example of both? Um, I'll give it a go. Thanks, so, common, common common law is judge made law, and sorry, what's the other one called? Equid um, equity, equity, is that what you equity, call it? Yep. Equity, yep. Um, it's more of a par parliamentary made law. Is that right? Um, not quite. That's using the difference between parliamentary law, parliament legislation, and common law, which is judge made law. And that's, that's the first of the two ways that we use the term common law. Right. But what we're really talking about now is the difference between common law and equity, which is the mm -hmm. second way that we distinguish between, uh, which is second meaning of common law. So common law is judge-made law. Equity is judge-made law. So really, common law and equity are all part of common law in the wider sense. But if we go back, wind back to the days where common law judges could only provide certain remedies and courts of equity could provide other remedies, we have this sort of flow on today where we still talk about common law remedies and equitable remedies. Equity deals with fairness and justice and was more flexible. So an example of an equitable remedy is an injunction. An example of an injunction is specific performance. And there are lots of different types of injunctions. And I'd ask that you do a little bit of reading about injunctions. So you might need to understand how you can ask a court for an injunction. What's the basis of asking for an injunction? And what type of injunctions can you ask for? So specific performance is an example of an injunction where the court is providing an obligation on the other side to proceed with a contract that they should have proceeded with. So the order that you seek is, judge, please force them to proceed. They signed the contract. They're refusing to settle. We want the land and the seller's refusing to, to transfer it to us. The court, adopting an equitable principle, will say, 
yes, that's fair. I am now ordering you by this order of specific performance to transfer the title to the buyer. Thank you, judge. That's what we're after. So that's an order of specific performance. We called it an injunction because it's a mandatory injunction where you're, the court is forcing someone proactively, in getting someone to do something. The other type of injunction, probably more common, is where you ask the court to stop the court, uh, someone from doing something. So if you, if you dealt with dealing with, say, I don't know, a copyright case, you may go to court urgently asking the court for an injunction. And the injunction, which is equitable, might be an order to stop the publisher from selling any more of these books because it's subject to a copyright dispute. Do you understand? So you may go to the court initially to say, we want an injunction to stop them from doing something, but we also want them to pay over damages for the loss that we've sustained. So it's injunction first, damages later. Equitable remedy initially, and then a common law remedy, say damages down the track. So, sorry, John, yes, is it Tegan. almost like, to, so an injunction is like an immediate action, like something immediately has to happen from that? Exactly. That's it. That's typically how we use an injunction. So if your client comes to you and says, look, I want you to sort out this mess, you've got to think about more than just saying, yes, <clears throat> We can go to court. What I want you to say is, we can go to court. We're exercising federal jurisdiction or state jurisdiction. Here's the court where we go, and this is the remedy we seek. Sorry, I've just been talking too much today. Okay, any questions? All right. So have a look at the difference between common law and equity. Now just go to page 165, if you would. Sorry, my apologies. All right, so page 165, you'll see we have the state and territory court systems. And you'll see the financial limitations. There's no point going to the magistrate's court if we're dealing with a murder charge and asking for the court to finalise the matter there. There's no point going to the magistrate's court if we require an injunction because magistrates court have very limited ability to make injunction orders, QCAT has much greater power to make <coughs> orders for injunctions than the magistrates court. And there's not much point going to the magistrates court if you've got a claim that relates to, um, you know, a million dollars or a, a potential claim for a million dollars. But you've also got to consider, should we be going to the state courts or the federal court? So you've really got to understand the difference in the jurisdiction of, say, the magistrate's court, the district court, the Supreme Court, and QCAT when dealing with the Queensland courts. And you should understand the difference between um, the jurisdiction of, say, the federal court, the federal circuit court, and the family court, when dealing with Commonwealth matters, as well as tribunals, 
such as the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. So I'd urge you to do some research about that. <clears throat> and you'll see in page 142, there's some reference to the AAT, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. All right, page 146 sets out those um, sources of law, 165 and 167 deal with those financial institutions. Page 174 starts <clears throat> the starting point for civil and criminal proceedings. Now tonight we've already had a look at the way you might consider how criminal law proceedings are dealt with, but you need to understand, I guess, how do you control the pro proceedings? Are there questions and choices that you have? <clears throat> and also think about whether there are preliminary issues that might control action in a certain way. So for example, if you're instituting proceedings <clears throat> under the Commonwealth uh, civil uh, litigation regime, there are obligations to attend mediation. Likewise, if you're pursuing a family law parenting dispute, there are obligations imposed on the parties to attend mediation. So even if your client says, I don't want to mediate with the other side, just bear in mind that you may have that obligation. So you'll need to give that to um, that advice as well. So 179 outlines the difference between common law damages and equitable remedies, such as injunctions or specific performance, which is what we were talking about before. So that's at page 179. Have a good look at that, understand it. All right, page 189 deals with legal research skills. Um, you need to adopt a systematic approach. Have a look at that table on page 196 as a guide to planning your research and the, um, the uh, chart the, on, that you'll see on page 199 uh, is very good. And the flow chart at uh, page 201. It provides some details about primary and secondary sources. Okay, I know I'm moving quickly, but these are the things that I'd urge you to have a look at. Be ready to access good quality materials. We talked about that before. So if your preference is LexisNexis or Westlaw or Osley or Jade or the um, authorised um, websites, court websites, just have them ready to go. Okay, now after you've done all of that, think about the interpretation skills, which are in chapter seven. Now we do have statutory interpretation, so statutory interpretation for introduction to law is not a huge part of the testing regime, but you need to be aware of it. And finally, think about the thinking skills, which are referred to in chapter eight. And there may be some preliminary issues when it comes to thinking about matters. So if the question is a criminal law matter, then you may have to think about some preliminary issues such as the right to silence. And the fact that you may have to advise your client not to make a statement because that's their right. You might also, in a criminal law context, think about bail and what's involved in a bail hearing and understand a show cause situation. <clears throat> um, all of this you do within the context of legal reasoning and you'll, you'll remember the acronym and you, by now you've all got your preferred acronym, IRAC or CIRAC or MIRAT, whatever it might be. Um, and the idea of your toolkit finally, is for you to rely upon that skill that you've developed in the toolkit and the procedures that you've adopted in trying to answer the um, briefing paper question, which is in the form of the memorandum of advice. I've been doing a lot of talking tonight. Sorry my voice has failed me. Um, are there any questions before we sign off? All good? I've moved through pretty quickly. All right. 
All good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, been a very good quality students in this class. So I'm really appreciative about that. Thank you for your ongoing involvement. Good luck next week. And um, we will see you all in later courses. Um, and for some of you, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. I'll sign off now. All the best. Bye.